Our special keynote um, guest is here. And I would like to introduce um, first uh, Bishop Jennifer Asserville Burroughs, um, who is the bishop here in this diocese. And um, she's going to introduce our um, keynote speaker. Thanks, Jennifer. was our presiding bishop, so you all have been living right. Uh, so, uh, well done. And actually, as I think about it, this is like the easiest job in the world to introduce the most well-known Episcopalian on the planet. So, <laughs> there isn't a lot for me to say, but I, I, I do want to just um, intro with these remarks. I came to the Episcopal Church in the 80s and had already heard about Michael Bruce Curry and his preaching because of networks like the Union of Black Episcopalians. And it was in the year of um, summer of 2000 at Ocean Grove, in the big camp meeting um, space where the United Methodists would gather, that I heard Bishop Michael preach for the first time. Remember that, 2000? And the thing that I remembered was that, um, that impressed me most was that he was the first Episcopal priest I had seen approach a pulpit with a Bible in his hand. <laughs> now, to be and it wasn't just a Bible, it was obviously not a new Bible. It had duct tape on it, and it was kind of falling apart, and, and then he preached for like he does. You know, it was a, it was, we were there for a while, and we did not, we did not want to go home. It set the night on fire and got our conference then and started off right as well. Bishop Michael Curry has served um, in many places, notably the St. Philip's in Buffalo. Is that right? Yeah. You grew up there? And then St. James Lafayette Square, Baltimore, before becoming the Bishop of North Carolina, and now serving as our 27th presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church. I like to say that our God is an on-time God, and I think for sure our presiding bishop is the on-time presiding bishop we need for this time. Someone who is not only scripturally grounded, visionary, media savvy, able to speak across all kinds of difference and boundaries and to unite us all, and those who are curious about the Episcopal Church and are able to find a nugget in the words that he's offering in this moment, to get even more curious and then to ask questions and then to slowly join us. And so we could not ask for a better presiding bishop in this moment. And so it is my honor to introduce you to Michael Bruce Curry, the most reverend Michael Bruce Curry, presiding bishop in primate. get this on, make sure. <laughs> Am I on? Yeah. Oh, oh, good, okay. <laughs> thank you, and, and thank you, Bishop Jenna. Where'd she go? Oh, there she goes. <laughs> thank you, Bishop, and it really is a, a, a joy to be with you and uh, with Bishop Jennifer here um, in the diocese and at Waycross. And I, I have to say, I mean, I, now I know who I want to do my eulogy at the funeral. But anyway, <laughs> now, <laughs> you, you just got hired. <laughs> but <laughs> not anytime soon, but I mean, you know, eventually. <laughs> but I, I am, it is just a, a blessing. And, a, um, and I have to tell you just, and I know Bishop Brian and Bishop Ed are in the back there, and I think they will uh, amen this as well. But uh, Bishop Jennifer, is a sign of hope and a sign of joy. God is not finished with the Episcopal Church yet. We got work to do. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, for real. <laughs> and, and it really is uh, just neat to, to be with you with Brownwin. I don't know where she is, but Brownwin and um, um, folk from, oh, there she is, in the back. and. Um, she just blesses us um, and me and our, our staff and the youth, youth work and um, a lot of other stuff that she does, as you know, not only convention resolutions, but 
a lot of the work that she did on Safe Church training and Title IV um, so that we can become um, fully uh, the kind of church that reflects the love and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth where all of God's children and all of God's people are treated as children of God with love, respect, and honor, and where everybody is safe. And Brownwin has been involved in that work for a while. She didn't even know I knew all that, but, but she has. <laughs> so, and to be with you, um, I hope what I say will help and support and encourage you in the work that you're doing in our camps and conference centers, um, because there is a clear and real vocation um, that I think centers greatly on creating context of contemporary monastic formation. That's really what I think is going on in conference centers and camps. Um, the, I, I don't think it's an accident that, that you create and provide for environments for people at different ages, but especially for young people, um, that involve prayer, study, play, rest, community. I could be wrong, but that smells Benedictine. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I say you are involved in the creation of context for authentic monastic formation, contemporary monastic formation in our time, it was the monastic movement. Yeah, you knew I was gonna get the movement. <laughs> the monastic movement that re-injected the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth periodically into the life of the church when the church had strayed away. It was a Francis of Assisi who drove bishops crazy and a Clare who drove bishops crazy in the, the Franciscan movement that drove pap popes crazy because it was recentering them on Jesus of Nazareth. And so you, it seems to me, in the work you are doing are going to be even more critical in our time and in the days and years ahead as we move from being merely the Episcopal Church to actually embodying what it means to be the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. So I hope what I say will be helpful to that end. And if not, just take a good nap and enjoy it. <laughs> just, sort of, just, just go to sleep, you know. <laughs> let, me, let me give you a text, and, um, and a text, a song, and a poem. The text, Jeremiah 17. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by the water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when the heat comes, and its, leave, its leaves will stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious. Y'all hear me at church. And it does not cease to bear fruit. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. They shall be like a tree standing by the water with roots deep in the stream. Now the poem, I think I learned it in third grade. You probably did too. Joyce Kilmer, World War I. I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree for poems are writ by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good, good religion. I, I, I was all Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted with roots and streams of water. And there was a song. It went this way. I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. It was a song of the civil rights movement, sung in moments in Selma 
1965 when John Lewis, I was just with him the other day, was beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. It, and eventually a president, Lyndon Johnson, stood and called this nation to its greater self and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 came into being because some folks sang that song, I shall not be moved like a tree standing by the water. I shall not be moved. Y'all know, know that song? I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree standing by the water. I shall not be moved. That song has its origin in the words of Jeremiah. Those who trust in the Lord will be like a tree with roots planted deep in streams of water. A few years ago, Bishop, Bishop Ed and um, um, Ken and Stephanie and a, a number of Episcopalians and I went um, for Episcopal Relief and Development on a pilgrimage of, a pilgrimage of racial reconciliation. And, and so what we did was to kind of reverse a, a traject direction and crossing the middle passage across the Atlantic, this time by on airplanes on Delta Air, but nonetheless. <laughs> But far, far preferable to the boats, but anyway. And so we went to Ghana and spent time there and um, had an opportunity to not only experience some of the work that, that the um, province of West Africa and the Anglican Church of Ghana is doing together with Episcopal Relief and Development um, in terms of local economic development, and that kind of empowerment of women. I mean, we got to see women organizing a bank in a community. Um, it, was, it was amazing to watch these sisters at work um, while the men were at construction work. Um, and we even got to see, this is a side note, how much time do I have? <laughs> oh, we got, we, got, we got all day? All right, we're good. We, we even got, none of this is in the manuscript, but anyway. <laughs> But we even got to see go up north, um, and I'd been to Ghana many times, but I hadn't been um, up north. Um, and we went up north where Episcopal Relief and Development has been working for years on something I'd heard about but never had an opportunity to see. It was called the Donkey Project. Um, because part of what's going on in, in some of the villages up north in particular, um, there's, there is construction work. So the guys go off and do the construction work, and the women do the farming. Um, and the problem is oxen are big and they're tough to navigate and the women are ha were having trouble just managing them um, to till the soil. And so what they finally decided was that if they could train donkeys, um, that actually donkeys are much more manageable. I mean, they're big beasts too, but they're more manageable and they're actually better at it, as it turns out. And so women were able to do the farming, men were doing construction, and the women do the banking because you don't want the brothers handling the money. But anyway, <laughs> so we went to see this and we got to see the, 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 the whole project and see some of the donkeys. And they have obviously, whenever tourists or, or, or pilgrims, if you will, guests from the US come, they, they have what I call the fashion, uh, fashionista donkey. Because um, this donkey was like, I mean, she was just sort of like, just, you know, I mean, she was Miss Thang. It was like everything. <laughs> And she was just kind of standing there, and people would come up and were taking selfies with the donkey. And she was fine with it. Well, um, are you having trouble hearing me? Oh, OK. Anyway, the donkey was fine with it. And then they had another donkey who was not the fashionista donkey. And this other donkey was out in the field. And this donkey was hooked up um, to the plow. And she was going to have to do the work while Miss Thang was just sitting there looking pretty. <laughs> So after we saw, you know, the fashionista donkey, then we went to watch the other donkey plow the field. Well, apparently she didn't want to plow the field and she had a couple of her baby donkeys with her and they went wherever mama went and she broke loose and went out and there you had this donkey with this plow bouncing behind her <laughs> and then her baby donkeys following her. Then there were some goats who just happened to be hanging out in the neighborhood and they figured we got to get in on this too. And so the goats followed and then the villagers are chasing the donkeys and the goats and literally this whole comedy unfolds 
while the fashionista donkey is just sort of. <laughs> well, anyway, after we got to see that wonderful ministry of Episcopal Relief and Development, <laughs> We then re-entered from, from the world of empowerment um, to a time of disempowerment. And we retraced some of the travels of when slavers came and went inland, captured slaves, and then marched them like the Trail of Tears, Native Americans here, marched them on a Trail of Tears, a death march, where the weakest died, the oldest died, and only the strongest survived. And that was actually intentional, to only take the strongest. Halfway between inland and the ocean was a camp. And at the camp, they would rest the slaves, the newly captured slaves. And you could still see um, spots where um, they would dig out in the ground, in rock, I mean, in the rock. Um, like bowls, so that that's what people laid out of. I mean, they literally chiseled it out of the rock, and it's still there. And there was actually even evidence, and this is something I didn't know until we went, there was even evidence, the tour guide uh, told us, that there was an attempt to cover up what happened there. I mean, attempt, literally. And I said, oh, I thought only the Nazis did that. And so it was a place of, and it really did feel like a place of desolation, even now. And the reason it's known and the story of the place is known is because people who were in the nearby village kept telling the story and passed it on generation to generation. While we were there, you could look out on some hilly places where the bowls that people ate out of, and you could see some brushes and some trees. And there was this one tree in particular it was just huge. It's, I don't know the kind of tree, the kind that have like a, it looks like a big bush. But it's a tree. And it, and it has this trunk system that comes down. And in the ground, the trunk becomes a huge root system. And it's a system that goes deep in the soil, deep enough to find water because the northern part of Ganda is getting deserty. You're getting close to the desert. Now, when I say close, I mean, you're talking thousands of miles or whatever, but, I mean, but close. And so the land is actually changing. And so the roots of that tree have to go deep, deep in order to find the water. Old slaves used to sing a song, Deep River. My home is over Jordan, Lord. Deep river, I want to cross over into campground. Those roots go down deep till they find that deep water. But not only do they go deep, this is what blew me away. They go wide. They reach out wide and they stabilize that tree. It's deep and it's wide. And I realized when the guide told us how old it was. That tree had been there since the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, that tree was there when Ghana was a great kingdom. One of the great kingdoms with Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. These were kingdoms of, of with great armies and philosophers and scientists. And these were incredible kingdoms. In, when Europe was in the Dark Ages, Ghana, Mali, and Songhai were thriving with knowledge. A renaissance was happening. And then, as history often does, it flipped. And when the renaissance was happening in Europe, which was the rise of mercantile capitalism. Those, remember when we learned about social studies in fifth and sixth grade about the explorers? I just thought they were just benign explorers. They just liked to uh, you know, discover new things and scientific, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they didn't tell us what was really going on. <laughs> but it was in that period of time, in the rise of mercantile capitalism, that, that all of a sudden these explorers were also conquerors. And, 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 and when the conquerors came, they, it, you always sent in the Marines and then you sent in the missionaries. That's how it went. And it happened. And that tree was there. 
It had seen Ghana when it was great. And it saw Ghana when it fell. That tree was there when once great people were captured and carried off in bitter servitude. That tree was still there standing. It was there when, when Ghana eventually became part of the British Empire. It was there when Anglican missionaries came through. It was there in 1959 when Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, a great philosopher and economist in his own right, as the first prime minister of the newly freed and independent Ghana, it was there when he proclaimed liberty. And it was still there when Barack Obama went. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that tree was there like a tree standing down the water. I shall not be moved. It had strength because its roots were deep. And it had capacity because its roots were wide and inclusive. Oh, did y'all see where I just went? Did you like that? <laughs> and embracing. <laughs> and, and the truth is, I have a feeling Jeremiah understood that because he lived in a desert country where you got to go deep to find the water and you've got to go wide to stay the tide. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree standing by the water. I shall not be moved. Don't worry, guys, it's fine. <laughs> not, not to worry. I'm an old preacher, I know how to. Used to, I can out shout babies and <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, you were wondering what 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 does this have to do with anything? What this tree got to do with it? That tree in Africa? What's all that got to do with anything? There um, is in the fifteenth chapter of John's Gospel a passage where Jesus is talking to the disciples. Now remember, chapter fifteen is the Last Supper in John. It's about to get hard. And Jesus says to his followers, abide in me as I abide in you. As the branch can only live tied to the vine, so you will only have life tied into me. Because apart from me, you can do nothing we must really be on the right track because something is trying to stop us. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> what you have there, <laughs> I tell you, is you've actually got Jesus tapping into the wisdom of Jeremiah that the key to bearing fruit is tied to the root. And truly bearing fruit is going deep and going wide. Jesus was telling them, you will not march through this crucifixion. You will not make it through hard times. You will not it survive through changing circumstances. You will not make it as unless you are actually a branch of the root. My brothers and sisters, our life will only matter in the days to come not simply as the Episcopal Church. That's only a place to begin. We will have life and have it abundantly as the Episcopal branch. Y'all see where I'm going now, <laughs> of the Jesus movement. <laughs> and, and that is the key. I'm telling you, it's the key. Now, again, I'm not talking about a slogan or a can I'm not, That's not what I'm talking about. I'm really talking about Jesus. Otherwise, why are we doing this? I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, I'm 65 years old. I got a notice I can get my pension. <laughs> you know? I, but the truth is, 
Actually, my wife said, no, you aren't retiring anytime soon. I don't want you home that much. But anyway, that's a whole other issue. But at the truth is, we, we matter. We make a difference. Our impact is because of this Jesus of Nazareth. And, and I believe our impact on our lives, the impact on our lives, on the lives of those around us, and on the lives of those who don't even know the Episcopal Church exists, but if they did, it's a community they'd want to be a part of. I really believe that, but it's because, not because we are whatever party at prayer, not because we are nice and sophisticated people, which we are, we really are, you know, we're all right. Um, but that's not what, nobody's coming to us because we put on a good show on Sunday morning. They can get a good show on Saturday night. And if they don't have any money, just watch Saturday Night Live and you'll get a good show. <laughs> I mean, nobody needs us for a good show. Nobody needs us because we are the wealthy people at prayer. Nobody, no, none of that stuff, that's okay. But that's not what, but Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth makes a difference. This brother's got something to say. You know, we call him Lord not because he's big and bad. Because this brother knows something we need to know. That's, that's what's going on there and, I've got to tell you, and this is a side note, again, something else that's not in what I had outlined, but, <laughs> but the truth is, if you look at the history of Christianity, it has always gone wrong the further it has gotten from the teachings, the example, and the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. I kid you not. I mean, it, you go through Christian history. I mean, one of the things that Francis of Assisi did um, was actually call the church back to the simple core teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's why the popes and the bishops and the hierarchy, they were upset with him. And to this day, Franciscans drive the curia crazy. They do. I mean, it's true because they march to the beat of a different drummer. And it is not the drumbeat of this world. It is the drumbeat of the Nazarene. And that's a different drumbeat. And the truth is, and you can trace it through history. If you look at the debates over slavery in our country, those who argued from a Christian perspective in favor of slavery rarely cited Jesus of Nazareth. They went to Paul. They went to certain parts of, of the Hebrew scriptures. They didn't mess with the prophets, <laughs> but went to certain parts of the Hebrew. You like, it's actually true. And those who argued for the abolition of slavery went to Jesus. Now, I think that's, that's telling us something. And true, I remember when I was in college, and <laughs> that's an accomplishment to bring. It's been so long. But anyway, it, but I, I took a course, took a couple of literature courses, but took one in particular. And we read um, Brothers Karamazov. Um, yeah, that was some serious. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's good to do that when you have a young mind. Um, but anyway, I don't remember most of it, but the part I do remember um, was the part about the Grand Inquisitor, which is like about midway through, if I remember correctly. And um, it's, it's where Dostoevsky has got it. The setting is the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition was that period of time when the church, moving away from Jesus, did evangelism by persecution. And that's when Jews in Spain cried out for the Moors, the Muslims, to come back because the Muslims at least treated them like human beings and the Christians enslaved them and burned Jews at the stake. Oh, the further the church, the further we get from Jesus of Nazareth, that's when we get in trouble. And in Dostoevsky, now I have to tell you, I didn't take the course because I was so virtuous. I really wasn't, but there was a girl who was taking it and I was really, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, that's the real reason I took the class. But <laughs> And in spite of myself, I actually learned something. Uh, but if you remember in the Grand Inquisitor, um, in that section, Dostoevsky actually pretends that Jesus comes back to Seville. And he comes back and he's teaching again like he did in the first century in the New Testament. And he's teaching and the poor and the common people are gathering around him. He comes back and he's healing people. He's touching them and touching their lives. And the common people, they're gathering around him and the church is furious. And the Inquisition arrests him. And the Grand Inquisitor questions him. And he said, Jesus, you don't understand. You were wrong 
when the devil tempted you. You missed a golden opportunity. All you had to do was do a little genuflection before the sacrament of Satan. And he would have given you all the kingdoms of the world. We've learned from your mistake. Now, this is the representative of the church. We've learned from your mistake. And we now have a partnership with the devil. And now the world is ours. The further the church goes from Jesus of Nazareth, it loses its soul. We lose our soul. But the closer, I'm not saying it's to depress you, don't worry. The closer we come, not to the cultural, I'm not talking about the cultural Christ. I'm talking about Jesus of Nazareth in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor and the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the compassionate. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst that God's righteous justice might prevail in all the world. Blessed are those who are persecuted for trying to do what is right. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. I'm talking about that Jesus, the Jesus of the New Testament. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm talking about that Jesus. That Jesus is a game changer. As the Father has loved me, he says, so have I loved you. Now abide in my love. I'm the vine. You're the branches. By this, you will bear much fruit. The truth is, this Jesus of Nazareth, he matters. And in our time, and in our culture here in America, it may be that the very soul of Christianity is at stake right now. I don't say that in a sense of judgment at all. I really don't. But sometimes I fear that representative voices of Christianity in the popular media, it just doesn't look and smell like the Jesus I know. The Jesus I know is the Jesus who touched lepers. The Jesus I know is the woman who healed that, healed that woman who was so, had been beaten down so much, she just wanted to sneak up close and touch the hem of his garment. Didn't want anybody to see because the world had beaten it down. Jesus, I know, looked at that other, we call them a thief. They were political revolutionaries. <laughs> the good revolutionary. <laughs> and says, today you'll be with me in the kingdom. Jesus, I know, is the parable of the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter, or Betty Ed, as Desmond Tutu likes to say, the parable of the prodigal God. That's the Jesus I know, and that's not often. The Jesus I know says, you want to know what Judgment Day looks like? Here's what Judgment Day looks like, because what Judgment Day is, it's a parable. That's a good thing, Matthew 25. It's a good thing. It's a parable. It's not a literal description of what's going to happen at the end, but, it, 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 uh, but it's, a, it's a good parable. Um, the Jesus I know tells that parable. You want to know what God cares about? You want to know what, what matters to God? Listen to when, what happens when the king comes in glory at the end of time. He comes with all the nations arrayed before him. And, and to the righteous ones, he says, come with me. Enter the kingdom prepared from you from the foundations of the wor world. And, and you can see, I have this image of these people. Say, you know, my grandma used to like to sing that song. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And I can see folks singing that like my grandma. Just as happy to go off. Go, we're going to heaven. And, and somebody stops and says, wait a minute. Why are we going to heaven? And Jesus says, well, when I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was alone and you visited me and cared for me. And they said, well, that sounds good. And they start going off to heaven. Somebody said, wait a minute, wait a minute. When did we see you hungry? I, don't misunderstand. I, I want to go to heaven, but I don't remember actually seeing you hungry. When did we see you naked? When did we see you alone and visit you? And then Jesus says, whenever you did it to one of these who is the least of my children of my family, you have done it unto me. That's the Jesus I know. And that is the Jesus that must be raised again in the heart of our church, 
in the public squares of our land, and in our global community. Oh, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. It's Jesus. No. Actually, Ruth Bader Ginsburg might help. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you saw over um, Thanksgiving holiday and, and Christmas, the nice thing, I'll tell you a little secret, the nice thing about being a bishop at Christmas, nobody wants you. <laughs> Which means you can actually rest. I mean, don't y'all tell anybody that. I don't want, to, yeah, don't want it to get out. And so I got to be home a lot. I'm home enough for my wife to finally say, when are you going back to work? But anyway, but anyway, over I got I watched a lot of TV and um, uh, you know, a lot. Judge Judy. I love Judge Judy. But anyway, a lot of TV. And uh, but did watch, you know, CNN, you know, and, and, you know, to get a little education, keep up on the news. But after a while, you get tired of the news. I don't want to know about it. Let me just go back to Judge Judy. And and uh, but on CNN, both over Thanksgiving and over Christmas, they had a special documentary on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ginsburg. And it was um, um, some, some young women um, had done a biographical piece on her and were behind it, and it was called The Notorious R.B.G. I love that. You, you remember The Notorious B.I.G.? You remember him? I wouldn't have put The Notorious B.I.G. and Ruth Bader Ginsburg together. I can't even imagine that happening. <laughs> But it was this one, it's an incredible um, um, bi uh, biographical documentary on just a remarkable woman, a remarkable person, a remarkable jurist. And, and it was a, it's a wonderful way of realizing a woman who fought and labored for true human equality and equality of women in this society back before it was fashionable to do so. She was working the courts, working the court, breaking into the boys' clubs work in the courts. And there was one point in the film when they were talking to her about her friendship with Anton Scalia, who, the late Anton Scalia, who was a jurist, who was a really conservative <laughs> jurist. And the two of them were probably on opposite sides of most controversial issues, and yet they were best friends. Partially because they and their spouses, they loved opera, so they would go to opera together. But more than that, at one point she stopped and she said, but we both love the Constitution of the United States, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, to establish the domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense. We the people. She said, both of us love the Constitution and what it stands for. And there was our common ground. And then she went on to explain the history of the Constitution. That in the decision in 1803, Marbury versus Madison, I remember reading this in social, social studies in like the fifth grade or something like that. Up until that time, people thought the Constitution was a set of noble principles and values uh, that represented us as the newly American, new American country, but that the Constitution wasn't really a law. And that got challenged in 1803, in that particular case. And that was the case where the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution of the United States is, and I quote, the supreme law of the land. And all law in America must conform to that Constitution. Y'all with me on that? So A lawyer came up to Jesus one day and asked Jesus, what is the greatest law? Y'all with me now, you see where I'm going. What is the greatest law in the entire legal edifice of Moses? That's what he did. It's in Matthew 22. I'm not making this up. What is the greatest law? What is the Constitution? What is the supreme law of God? What is the will of God? What is the dream of God? What is the truth of God with which there is no compromise that everything that claims to be religious 
has got to conform to. And Jesus reached back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. That's why you can tell anybody if it's not about love, it's not about God. And if it's not about love, it is not Christian. That's true. Period. That's what Jesus is about. And a Jesus movement is about following the way of Jesus which is the way of unselfish, unconditional, sacrificial love. But I don't know about you, but it's easy to love the people who agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it gets a little bit more difficult with the other ones. And Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't say like them, <laughs> but he just said love them, care about them, care for them. And, and the truth is, it's not always, it, which, which means, and I said this at the revival in Southwest Virginia yesterday. Well, by the way, we had a good revival, uh, a good revival. Um, and anyway, I mean, not because of me, but because of the folk. I mean, the folk really did, they did it. But I said this to them yesterday. I said, the truth is, it, love your neighbor as yourself. The master's very clear about that, which means love yourself, but you got to love that neighbor. And th what that means is, if there are any Democrats in this room right now, you got to love that Republican neighbor. Anybody voted for Hillary? You got to love somebody who voted for Trump. Oh, church ain't saying amen now. I hear, oh, I, you, see, you see what I'm getting at. The truth is, uh, but that's what this love thy neighbor as thyself, it means everybody. It means all of us. And the truth is, you know as well as I do, we would have a very different world if we would just do that. Don't think I'm just saying something to you. I was just preaching to members of Congress two weeks ago and said the same thing to them. And they said amen. I said, now go and do it. <laughs> Just go and do it. <laughs> and God bless them. Some of them really are trying. They really are. But it's not easy. Because if you're like me, there's a part of you that's relatively self-centered. I'll speak for me. <laughs> and it's easy to love those who love me. Jesus said, even the Gentiles do that. But, but to love those who don't, that's harder. And I need some help. I need to gird my loin and get my grits. But I need some grace to do that. And that's why we shared with our church some spiritual practices called the way of love. You see what it's getting? That can actually help us live into being Jesus-centered people in the Jesus movement in our time. Because this way of love really does change lives. And it can change the world. I'm going to stop. I have no idea. This is a preacher's heaven because there's no clocks in here. I mean, it's like, I mean this, is, this is really quite wonderful. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I was in one of our dioceses. Um, oh, this is about two years ago, I guess it was. And um, it was a, re a regular visit, you know, um, to the diocese. And, and the presiding bishop does like your bishops do, where you go to each congregation, where I go to each diocese over the course of nine years and um, drive the local bishop crazy. But anyway, go, go on and do it. And so I was visiting this one particular diocese, and after the banquet, it was at the time of their diocesan convention, at the end of the banquet, um, uh, people were coming up for selfies. Um, coming up, so we were taking selfies, and, and people were coming up to say, you know, hello, and that kind of stuff. And, and it was wonderful, and we were having a good time. But I noticed 
kind of off in the, and you see Bishop Pryor right there. About that far away, I can see a guy who's about actually uh, uh, Bishop Kineski's height. Um, and he looked a little bigger than Ed um, and had a beard. Um, and he, he was a white guy. Um, and I think he still is, but anyway, he was then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he was standing back there, right about the distance where they are, and he was in line. And so, you know, he was coming forward, and I noticed him, but, you know, because uh, people were chatting with people, and he was talking with people, but, but he, like I said, he looked like the picture you see of John Brown with the beard coming down, you know. Um, he looked a little fearsome, and so I had my eye on him, and um, so, you know, people were still coming up, and I'm taking pictures, and we're talking, and eventually he got up, and he was just standing there like this. I'm thinking, oh, sweet Jesus. I, and I was thinking, oh, man. I, I said, I hope he's friendly. Anyway, so, so he, was, he kept finally, eventually finally got to me, and he said, I'd like to talk to you. I said, yes, uh, yes. Um, um, and he went, he said, I just need to tell you a story. He said, I grew up in a home that purported to be a Christian home. My father and my uncle we're all members of the Klan. And we were taught to hate that that was the Christian way. And I went off to school, went off to college, and came out of college and moved to a little town. I want to say this was in Arkansas, but I'm not absolutely sure. I think in Arkansas. He moved to a little town, and he had never heard of the Episcopal Church before, but he went in a little bitty Episcopal Church in the town. He just happened in there some Sunday. And he liked it and stayed. And over time, he got to know the people, and he said they were just nice people. And he said all they talked about was love. And he said eventually, I told them who I was. And he said, they kept loving me anyway. And he said, for the first time in my life, I realized who Jesus really is from those people in that church because they loved me. And I just wanted to come up and tell you, I'm so happy you're my presiding bishop. I love you. And I said, brother, you don't know how happy I am, too. I said, I love, I love you. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> this way of love, which is the way of Jesus, it's the way of life. And you and your ministries provide a context where people can actually explore that life. Living in community for a little bit, praying together, learning from scripture, worshiping, blessing, playing, resting, and then going into the world to bless it in Jesus' name. We need you more now than we have ever needed you before. I shall not be I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay.